here. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, just a few things at the top, and then happy to jump in and take your questions. Um, as you know, on Wednesday, Secretary Austin concluded his 11th trip to the Indo-Pacific. With stops in Tokyo, Japan, and Manila, Philippines, the Secretary participated in a series of historic engagements as part of the Department's ongoing work to bolster our partnerships and alliances to advance a shared vision of regional peace, stability, and deterrence. Highlights from the trip included two plus two meetings with the Secretary's Japanese and Philippine counterparts, as well as a historic first ever trilateral ministerial meeting between the US, Japan, and the ROC. Additionally, the Secretary made a trip to Subic Bay in the Philippines, where he met with service members and DOD personnel hard at work strengthening our defense industrial bases like never before. The Secretary's 11th trip to the region highlighted yet again how under the leadership of the Biden-Harris administration, the United States is delivering historic results in the Indo-Pacific. The United States is operating with our partners and allies more closely and more capably than ever and together. We are working to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Switching gears. Secretary Austin spoke with Israeli Minister of Defense Gallant this morning about the destabilizing threats posed by Iran, its partners, and proxies. The secretary reiterated ironclad support for Israel's security and informed the minister of additional measures to include ongoing and future defensive force posture changes that the department will take to support the defense of Israel. Secretary Austin highlighted that Further escalation is not inevitable, and that all countries in the region would benefit from a de-escalation in tensions, including through completing a Gaza ceasefire and hostage release deal. He also stressed that the unprecedented scale of U.S. support for Israel since October 7th should leave Iran, Lebanese Hezbollah, and other Iranian-backed terrorist groups with no doubt about U.S. resolve. Switching gears. The Senate this week confirmed more than 3,000 officers nominated throughout the Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and Space, uh, Space Force. The Senate also fully confirmed Dr. Michael Sulmeyer to be Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy. Together, they will all continue to be great leaders within our, within our department and will ensure we remain the finest military in the world. The Senate Armed Services Committee also voted this week to advance Tanya Wilkinson, nominee to be Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. We now urge the Senate to confirm all of our civilian and military nominees waiting for action on the Senate floor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, the Department of Defense, in coordination with the Department of Veterans Affairs, developed Airborne Hazards and Open Burn Pit Registry to assist service members and veterans in documenting potential exposure to airborne hazards during overseas deployment. The VA announced updates to the Burn Pit Registry yesterday, and registry updates will now allow service members and veterans to provide more feedback, expand participation criteria, automatically include participants, and simplify registry requirements. To learn more, visit the registry site at www.publichealth.va.gov. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Tara, why don't you start us off? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the Middle East. What, if any, sort of contingency planning is occurring to assist Americans in evacuation if that's needed? And what types of force posture changes are being considered to better protect troops if this escalates? I'll take the uh, second question first. So um, as you know, and as we've demonstrated since October, and again in April, the United States' global defense is dynamic, and the department retains the capability to deploy on short notice to meet evolving national security threats. Um, so as a result, the secretary will be directing multiple forthcoming fo force posture moves to bolster force protection for U.S. forces region-wide to provide elevated support to the defense of Israel and to ensure the United States is prepared to respond to this evolving crisis. In terms of what specifics that means, I don't have that for you right now. Um, again, that's something that the secretary will be um, directing at a later time, but when we have more specifics, I'll certainly come back to you. Um, in terms of planning measures, we are a planning organization, as I know you've heard us say before. Um, so I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals, but of course we always have contingency plans in place. Um, but again, just not going to go down the hypothetical route. So on the force posture changes, sure. though, you say at a later date, are we talking, I mean, 
within hours, within a couple of days, by this weekend? And would these troops be being pulled from the Indo-Pacific, or are these domestic forces that would be sent? In, in terms of specific troops or capabilities, again, this is something that's with the secretary, and the secretary will be deciding. Um, I don't have a specific timeline for you. Once we have more information, um, as you know, we'll certainly provide it. But at this moment, I just don't. I just don't have that. Oren. I just want to be clear here. Yesterday, President Biden spoke with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and spoke of, and I quote here, uh, new defensive U.S. military deployments. Yeah. Those haven't been ordered yet. He was speaking hypothetically yesterday, or has have they been decided and ordered at this point? The secretary and the president have been in close um, uh, conversations about this. Uh, the secretary will be directing forthcoming force posture uh, moves to bolster our force protection. Um, so there's a commitment that was made in the call with the president and Prime Minister Netanyahu um, in terms of what specific units, what specific capabilities. That's something that the secretary will decide. Um, I don't have an exact timeline of, of when that decision will be made, um, but that was a commitment that the president reiterated to Prime Minister Netanyahu that you saw on the call yesterday. And again, the secretary reiterated that in his call with Minister Gallant that happened earlier this morning. And, and just to be clear on the wording here, because mm -hmm. The word defensive is very prominent in what you're saying. There are no, it is purely defensive. Is this ground-based air defenses? Is it is it air defenses based on destroyers? A and you're not shifting any offensive capabilities? So pr appreciate the question. Um, so again, these are defensive capabilities. Um, as we have done before since October 7th and what we did on April 13th, all of our capabilities that we have there in the region are defensive and to um, send a message of deterrence. Um, the secretary on his call committed to Minister Gallant that the United States will stand with Israel in their self-defense. So these would be defensive capabilities if needed. Thank you. Yeah, Phil. Um, just a, a couple of follow-ups. So I'm a little, just to be, so you, the secretary has not yet decided on, on what capabilities to deploy, um, but does that mean also that he's not necessarily decided whether a, a, you know, additional whether there are there's a need for additional forces beyond what's already uh, in in the region right now, and, and I'm talking about you know uh, additional you know even if there were like you know some troops rotating in or rotating out, additional to like kind of the status quo as it stands, not the actual units. So there could be additional units that come in with additional capabilities, as those capabilities would need to be operated by additional people. Um, but again, I'm not going to get ahead of any decisions that the secretary has not made yet. Um, all I can tell you is that um, he, in his call with Minister Gallant, committed to um, bolster force protection in the region. And of course, as, as Oren was saying earlier, um, you know, def additional defensive capabilities if needed for the support of Israel. I guess what I'm just trying to understand sure. is, does that mean a plus up or, or not in terms of overall U.S. forces and capabilities in the region? It certainly could mean additional uh, capabilities and people in the region, as those people would have to operate if the secretary decides to, um, you know, include more defensive capabilities, they're going to need to be operated by additional people. So again, I don't have the decision yet from the secretary. The secretary um, is it's something that he, you know, he's going to continue to weigh. And when we have more to read out, we certainly will. Tony. Uh, of the units that are already in the region, is it possible the secretary would order a repositioning of the 24th Mew and the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Battle Group from the Gulf of Oman up this Red Sea and through the Strait of uh, Suez Canal to uh, off of Israel and Lebanon? Is that a possibility? So you have to remember that the that the Arg Mew has always been operating within the Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah. So she remains in the Eastern Mediterranean. And just like we saw with the Eisenhower carrier strike group that was in um, the CENTCOM AOR uh, earlier this year, the Eisenhower continued to move around within the AOR. So the TR could move around within the AOR, but of course I'm not gonna get ahead of any movements or force posture changes that um, the commander decides to make or that the secretary decides to make. The force posture in this, those cases could be repositioning of ships already in the region versus bringing in new vessels from Asia or something. There could be a repositioning of assets, but again, that's something that um, the secretary will be directing, and I'm not going to get ahead of any decisions that the secretary has made at this time. So I can do this today or later today? I don't have a timeline for you. 
Yeah, of course, yeah. Thank Wait. you, Sabrina, um, for the Italian television. Uh, what kind of um, talk or coordination the Pentagon has, or having, or had, uh, with state like Italy or Southern European state that can be more involved in support of the U.S. in case of uh, Iranian attack to Israel? And uh, the second question is, is that the kind of talk that the Pentagon is having with the Arabic state that are part of the deal, that the negotiation, that now have to be neutral between Iran and Israel. So um, those are my two questions. What's the strategy? So we're always in touch with our partners and allies. Um, as you've seen with the events of October 7th, um, and you've also seen with um, the coalition of Operation Prosperity Guardian, that is allies and partners coming together in the region either to support in the defense of Israel or to ensure that commercial shipping can go continue through the Red Sea and ensure that the international rules-based order is upheld. So this is something that we're always in touch with our allies and partners on. Um, in terms of you know any calls to read out, I don't have anything more additional to provide, but I can assure you that at all levels of government, whether here at the department or, or somewhere else, um, we are always in communication when it comes to um, what is happening in the region and of course closely coordinating with our partners. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, for maybe I haven't asked what, what I meant. Uh, it's like if the, US, the Pentagon have asked for military support on the Mediterranean close to Israel, to, European, to the European Union. I don't have anything to read out, but as you know, Operation Prosperity Guardian is a coalition of like-minded nations coming together to ensure um, that, you know, commercial trade can continue to flow through, but also responding to the ongoing attacks from the Houthis, um, that they continue to lob at our ships, allied partners and ships, and commercial vessels. So um, I just don't have anything more to, to, to read out for you, but I would point you to the fact that we have this large coalition that's already operating within the Red Sea. Thank Charlie. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Sabrina, when it comes to a timeline, uh, the U.S. military isn't the only one who gets a vote. Uh, there will be a window that we've been expecting learning uh, over the next sort of 72 hours. We're here late Sunday, Monday, where Iran might retaliate. Hezbollah might even retaliate before that, and then a joint retaliation. So whether the decisions have been made, wouldn't there have been a movement of U.S. resources already in order to defend against that? Well, Charlie, I would remind you that in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the CENTCOM AOR, we have many, many assets that are there. You have the um, <clears throat> ARGMU that is continuing to operate in the Eastern Mediterranean. There are also destroyers there. You have the TR and um, the entire carrier strike group that's also continuing to operate in the CENTCOM AOR. So it's not like we don't have assets or coverage in the region. So I, th I think that's important. Um, again, this is a decision that the secretary um, is is Wang and he committed to Minister Gallant and the president committed um, to Netanyahu that we will be bolstering our force protection in the region. But what specific assets will be moving? I just don't have that for you right now. Um, when I do, we'll certainly let you know. So presumably some of that would already have to be underway if you're talking about force posture changes. Again, I don't have anything to announce right now. Yes. Uh, this, um, so, so to what extent are you concerned about or seeing any <coughs> indications that Iran may attempt to retaliate against Israel outside of the Middle East? Well, I've seen their public comments. Um, I don't have anything more to provide other than I can point you to the fact that they have what publicly of what they've said. Um, in terms of what we are doing here at the department is we will stand with Israel in their self-defense. And that was something that the secretary reiterated to Minister Gallant on his call this morning. Is there any communication between the U.S. and um, Iran directly or indirectly to prevent any further escalation? On behalf of the department, I don't have anything to read out. Yeah, Chris. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, the Iraqi government um, and the spokesman for their armed forces expressed um, outrage at the U.S. airstrike um, in Iraq a couple days ago on the UAV site and said it violated uh, Iraqi sovereignty. Um, did the U.S. discuss that military action with the Iraqis, and what is the Pentagon's response on whether that airstrike violated Iraqi sovereignty? You're talking about the um, airstrike that we took on the 30th? Yes. So that airstrike was a defensive airstrike. Um, 
And we were targeting combatants that were attempting to launch one-way attack, uh, an uncrewed air, uh, attack system at our forces. So it was a defensive measure that we took. Um, in terms of communication with the Iraqi government, I would point you to CENTCOM to speak to that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, on the same uh, Iraqi comments, the Iraqi government says that this attack undermines all the efforts and diplomatic and technical discussion with the U.S. government. So what, what's your comment on that? Has this affected your communication, your discussions with the Iraqi government when it comes to the higher military commission and also all the discussion with the Iraqi government? We don't believe that it's impacted um, conversations uh, related to the higher military commission. We have been very, very clear that we will take measures in order to ensure our forces are safe in the region. Um, and that's what you saw with that July 30th um, strike. We were taking measures because we saw that um, an attack was about to be launched on our forces. And we've been very clear about that with um, the Iraqi government, both publicly here from the podium, you've heard me say that a number of times, and privately. Um, we will always take measures that we need to in order to ensure our service members' safety um, in the region. And so we did just that on July 30th. If needed, we will continue to do that. Um, and we've been pretty clear about that from the beginning. Yeah, and, and as it comes to the Iranian response to the, the killing of Ismail Haniya, uh, it's expected that the Iraqi militia group is backed by Iran be involved in targeting the U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. So have you reached the Iraqi government to prevent any such attack in Iraq? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, when it comes to the Iranian response to the Ismail Haniya's killing mm -hmm. and attacking Israel, there are some officials and also there are some reports suggesting that the Iraqi militia group is, may attack the US forces inside Iraq and in Syria. Okay. In the response sorry. to that. And have you reached the Iraqi government to prevent such attack? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your, your question at the beginning. Um, I've seen the public comments that were made about um, from, uh, you know, allowing attacks on U.S. forces. And what I will say to you is what exactly I said for your first question, is that we will always take measures to ensure the safety and security of our personnel stationed anywhere around the world. Um, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. I'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm going to go to the phones and then happy to come back in the room. Uh, Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Thanks, Sabrina. I appreciate it. Um, made a couple checks this week, and it appears we, we've had no uh, U.S. destroyers in the Red Sea for several days at a pretty dynamic time. Uh, can, can you explain that decision? Is, is there something going on there, you know, in light of the Houthi attack that, that, that caught me by surprise? Uh, thanks, Dan, for your question. In terms of, you know, movements within the Red Sea and, and uh, positions of different ships, I'd really direct you to CENTCOM to speak to that. Um, as you know, they, they put out almost daily updates of, um, you know, engagements that they have done, um, either uh, shooting down incoming missiles that are coming from Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen um, or, or other engagements. But I, I would remind you that just because a U.S. ship is not in the Red Sea does not mean that you don't have other coalition ships part of Operation Prosperity Guardian um, in the Red Sea and continuing to engage in, um, you know, attacks coming from Houthi-controlled areas. Um, I will take another one from the phone. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. Have any units been uh, placed on prepared to deploy orders um, in light of the situation with Israel and Iran and Hezbollah? And also, uh, there were two non-combat deaths in Iraq. Can Does OSD have any information about what happened? Um, thanks, Jeff, for your question. So I would direct you to the um, Army to speak more to those um, non-combat deaths that you referenced. So I just don't have more for you at this time. Um, in terms of any units placed on PTDO orders, again, as, as I mentioned, um, the Secretary spoke with Minister Gallant earlier today. Um, he is going to make the – we are going to make a decision on um, – ongoing and future defensive force, force posture changes. Um, I'm not aware that any units have been put on PTDO orders at this time. Um, and when we have more to provide, we certainly will. Um, I'll come back in the room. Yeah, Janie. Thank you, I'll come back Sabrina. A couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, South Korea's defense minister said recently uh, there was a possibility that North Korea would conduct 
its seventh nuclear test before or after the U.S. Uh, presidential election. What do you think about the possibility of North Korea interfering in the U.S. Uh, presidential election? Well, Janie, as we've mentioned before, you know, those tests are extremely destabilizing to the region, um, and we want to see a, de a denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, on the secretary's trip to the Indo-Pacific, as I mentioned at the top, you know, he held a historic trilateral meeting in Tokyo with the Minister of Defense from Korea and um, the Japanese foreign minister. And of course, something that came up was the DPRK's continued destabilizing actions. Um, and this was a, a, a large topic of conversation throughout the week. Um, it's something that we're going to continue to monitor. It's something that we'll always work with our ROC and Japanese allies on and, co and coordinating on. Um, but any tests like that um, are incredibly destabilizing to the region, and we'll continue to monitor. Okay, one more last sure. week. Biping uh, Narang, acting adjutant secretary for space policy, recently said that the North, if North Korea, China, Russia do not change their nuclear trajectories, the scale of the U.S. nuclear posture must be changed, I mean, adjusted. Do you think it is possible to increase nuclear assets in South Korea? Uh, no. Uh, no. I mean, I would, sorry, I shouldn't have been so direct. I haven't seen all of his comments. Um, certainly what we want to see is a, de a denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, the secretary, while in Tokyo made um, a number of announcements that I'm sure you're tracking on the upgrade of US forces Japan to a unified command. Um, beyond that, I don't have any more announcements. And I'm sorry, I just haven't seen some of those comments, so I don't have more to add at this time. In the back, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. You noted that uh, in his conversation with uh, Defense Minister Gallant, Secretary Austin expressed concern about the dangers of escalation. Mm -hmm. Did he? Uh, also speak to Gallant or warn Israel uh, about the dangers of escalating the conflict should Iran retaliate, uh, prompting a large-scale Israeli retaliation or strike on Iran. Is that something that uh, was discussed, and uh, if so, how? Yeah, so we'll have a readout later today of their call. Um, I'm not really going to go beyond what I said at the top other than to emphasize that the secretary highlighted that escalation is not inevitable and that all countries in the region would benefit from de-escalation. And I'll leave it at that. If I could just follow sure. up. Uh, you, 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 you noted again that the, the secretary talked about the dangers of escalation. Uh, President Biden said that the assassination of, uh, of Hania was a uh, were not helpful to the ceasefire negotiation process. Doesn't this bolstering of defense uh, in uh, for Israel represent a kind of reward to Israel for destabilizing that very process that both the secretary and the president are saying they want to continue? No, I'd respectfully push back on that. Um, what we are doing to bolster our capabilities is in the defense of Israel and and by nature is defensive. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't say that it escalates tension. In fact, some of the decisions that the secretary has made since October 7th, you might remember we moved the Ford, the uh, USS Ford carrier strike group to the Eastern Med on October 8th. Uh, we moved the Ike um, soon thereafter to the CENTCOM AOR. These were all to project a message of deterrence. Um, we certainly do not want to see this spread out to a wider regional conflict. We don't believe it has right now. Um, we're going to continue to urge for de-escalation. And the best way for that to happen is for this ceasefire deal to come through. And so we can get American hostages out as well. Um, but we believe that that would be the best way to, to de-escalate and, um, you know, further lower tensions in the region. Uh, Louis, sorry, I thought I saw you over there. Two questions. Sure. Um, you, you noted that the commitment has been made by the president and by the secretary um, what is triggering those commitments? I think uh, you can point to um, events that have happened uh, in the past week. 
Um, again, we don't want to see an escalation. We want to see things to de-escalate. And because of that, we are committing defensive capabilities to the region that uh, I don't have an announcement of what those will be. But when we do, we will certainly read those out. And the second one, you, you, in this answer right here, you kind of spoke to it. But mm -hmm. by making this public, isn't this just a deterrent as well? Speaking from the podium? Yes, make, yes, announcing that you, you, there is a commitment that the secretary will decide on force protection yeah. measures that have not been actually decided on yet, which is kind of atypical, actually, for this building to actually make an announcement like this. So, therefore, I mean, is it, it your statement in itself a deterrent? Um, I mean, of, of course, we uh, are, when it comes to messaging, we do things publicly and privately. Um, so public messaging, we're very clear about um, the defensive capabilities that we are committing to the region and that we are going to bolster them um, because we don't want to see tensions continue to rise. We want to see a de-escalation. So um, if they are watching, if someone is watching this briefing overseas, um, I think we are being very direct in our messaging that um, certainly we don't want to see heightened tensions. And we do believe there is an off ramp here. And that is that ceasefire deal. Um, once that comes through and, and, you know, once hostages are released, that's what we really want to see here. Um, and we've said it from the beginning on, you know, um, the next day following October 7th is we don't want to see a wider regional conflict. Um, we don't believe we are there. And that's partly because we moved assets to the region that do project power and that also, I think, send a very strong message of deterrence. Um, I'm going to go to the phones and then happy to come back over here. Um, Howard Altman, war zone. Thanks, Sabrina. Can you confirm that the um, Air Force is going to be sending additional combat uh, aircraft to the region in response to all this? And um, what kind of airframes can you tell me? Yeah, thanks, Howard, for the question. I cannot at this time. Uh, Sam Legrone, US and I. Okay, happy to come back in the room. Goyal. Thank you, Madam. Two questions, please. One, this was the first time that Secretary, uh, there was an interaction between US and India, but Secretary met not the Defense Minister of India, but the Foreign Minister of India, Mr. Jay Shankar. And this was the first meeting after Prime Minister Modi visited. Moscow. So what was discussed between the two about this uh, meeting, the foreign minister, not the defense minister of India? I think uh, that question is better directed for the State Department. Secretary Blinken held that meeting. It was a quad meeting. So I direct you to, to the State Department to speak more to that. And second, Madam, uh, thousands of uh, people, millions of people watched burning of U.S. flag in Washington, D.C. during that uh, demonstration. Many were upset, in, including in my community, that burning of U.S. flag is, is like a, it's a unity. Uh, U.S. stands for unity and united. This building, many from this building, men and women, they fight every day to protect the U.S. flag. So what were the comments from the secretary about those uh, demonstrations had nothing to do with the U.S. flag, but they burned it and br brought down and they brought another flag on there, Hamas flag. So we certainly... Um don't support the burning of American flags, and we certainly don't support the raising of um, a flag from Hamas. Um, I believe even the White House put out a statement on that. Um, it was something that we that we monitored from here when it came to some of those um, demonstrations here in Washington, D.C., um, but that's not something that we support. That's not something that reflects the values of this building or this administration. Um, okay, Oren, and then Chris, and then happy to come back. <laughs> Sorry, or, or, look, I said Oren, but I'm looking at Chris. Go ahead. You, you said twice now, once in the opener and once a couple minutes ago, ongoing and future defensive force posture changes. We get the future part, the discussions, the decisions that will be made. What's the ongoing part? Uh, are there movements that have already happened or are happening based on orders that have already been given? No, it's just ongoing is what the commander decides in the region. So what he decides to move and reposition where, and I don't have anything to read out right now, but that would be the ongoing part. Those, those have been made already or are being made? I think ongoing means they, they will be made, but I'm just not going to get into a discussion on tenses from here. Okay, Chris. Thanks. Um, a, a numbers uh, clarification. Um, the airstrike in Iraq came in response to cases of uh, rockets being launched in, towards U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria. Uh, what is the total number 
of attacks against U.S. troops in Iraq, uh, Syria, and Jordan since October. So, I mean, Chris, just just one correction here. Um, not so much a response, but we saw um, we saw forces assembling to attack U.S. forces in Iraq. And or or U.S. forces um, in the region, and so we took defensive action. So I think it's important to remember that's not necessarily in response. We do have a right to respond and protect our forces anywhere around the world. Um, in terms of uh, attacks on U.S. forces, um, in total, I, from you're talking about from the very beginning. Yeah, 160, 170. What's the? I believe number? it's over 180. But again, you. That was from October 17th, from last year. Um, and, you know, since, I think, January or February, um, you know, we did see a slowdown of attacks. We saw um, one in April, and then again, we saw a long period of pause. And that's what we want to continue to see. Um, we do not, again, and I know I've said this, and you'll probably hate me for saying it again, but I'll just do it anyways. We do not want a regional war. We do not see this spilling out into a larger regional conflict, but we will take action to protect our forces anywhere in the world. Okay, great. Phil, and then last one over here. Um, uh, on, on the Iraq strike, I, mean, I understand that uh, you, you've explained that it was a defensive strike and that these mm -hmm. forces were preparing to, act, uh, to attack U.S. US, for, U.S. troops. Yeah. Do you think the timing of the strike uh, was interpreted uh, by Iran and, and others as, as part of the series of, of, of activities in, in the region at that time, the, the, the strike in, or the attack in, 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 Tar in Tehran and, and the other in, in Damascus and then the strike in, in Iraq? Do you think that they were interpreted as being, uh, you know, a, 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 a joint operation? And, and what would you say to people who would, who would make that? No, I wouldn't interpret it as a joint operation at all. I would say that um, the action that we took is similar to the actions that we've taken from when we started being uh, started getting attacked on October 17th. We will always take action um, that ensures the safety and security of our personnel. And we've done that from the very beginning. Um, what we saw was combatants attempting to launch uh, a UAS system. And so CENTCOM forces took action um, so that our forces were not hurt or injured um, if that attack had been able to launch. Um, but no, there's no, I would not read into any type of coordination. I would say that this is something that we've done time and time again, and we will do if we need to uh, at any time. Last question. Oh, and we got Jared, and then that's really last question. My previous question. Um, is the Pentagon um, um, have see that uh, like state like uh, um, partners allies like the Saudi or the Jordans will support um, still supporting in case of an attack to Israel from Yemen or Iran or the um, um, Hezbollah um, l because they were involved like um, uh, in the in the negotiation for the deal like um, Liban I mean like um, the Jordan the Saudi they helped in the deal with the Gaza now that the leader has been killed are they going to be neutral in your opinion or are they going to support Israel in case of an attack? What the Pentagon is... Um, so as you can appreciate, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. Um, we have great partnerships in the region and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Jared, last question. He beat me to it, but I might try to ask it a different way. Okay. Um, has the department been in, in contact with any allies uh, or potentially, uh, you know, regional partners on uh, these, co you know, in coordinating uh, ahead of a potential defense of Israel? So I don't have any calls to read out from the secretary, but I can tell you that uh, the department at all different levels is always in touch with their counterparts all around the world. Um, uh, but I don't have anything more specific to read out from the secretary this time. Okay, great. We'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone.